So, Lord Jesus, you said that God alone is good, and, and you are good. And so we worship God our Father in your name, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you would help us to preach. Amen. About uh, 40 years ago, my uh, dad was put on trial by the mainline liberal uh, Presbyterian church and, and removed from his church for being too conservative. He, he wanted to preach about Jesus. About 15 years ago, I was removed from my church by the conservative evangelical Presbyterian church that my dad uh, helped start uh, for being too liberal. But like my dad, I wanted to preach about Jesus. At my trial, I remember this guy stood up and he said, sounds to me like you're saying all dogs go to heaven. Uh, a, few, a few weeks later, my sister sent me this series of pictures. This is a, uh, a church sign for Our Lady of the Martyrs Catholic Church, and it says, all dogs go to heaven. The, the following day, on the other side of the street, at the Beulah Cumberland Presbyterian Church, uh, this was on the sign, only humans go to heaven, read the Bible. Then on the other side of the, of the street, God loves all his creatures, dogs included. In response, dogs don't have souls, this is not open for a debate. And then Catholic dogs go to heaven, Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. <laughs> then converting to Catholicism does not magically grant your dog a soul. And then free dog souls with conversion. And dogs are animals, they aren't any rocks in heaven either, and then finally, all rocks go to heaven. <laughs> it turns out that all of those photos were probably doctored due to uh, Photoshop, and those churches probably don't even exist, and yet they do. Our Lady of the Martyrs sounds like a classic liberal uh, church, liberal Christian church, and Beulah Presbyterian sounds like a classic conservative Christian church, and their fictional argument is a fairly good representation of two profoundly vague and confusing words that we all just tend to throw around all the time without much definition, and the words are liberal and, or liberal over here on your left, and, and conservative, liberal and conservative. Of course, the words mean very different things in different contexts, all right? But in the context of religion, don't we usually think of liberal churches as more inclusive, and so all dogs go to heaven. And we think of conservative churches as more exclusive, and so no dogs go to heaven, or maybe only Presbyterian dogs. Now, I don't want to be too dogmatic. Thank you, Glenn. Glenn told me that. He's worried that I was going to be too dogmatic. Don't be too dogmatic about this, but in my experience, liberal churches are really into peace, right? and inclusion, including all the dogs. I grew up in a mainline liberal church. And so we did trust exercises, talked about warm fuzzies at youth group, and, and we went on walks to, f remember Alan, we went on walks to find things that God had made. Liberals like verses like Psalm 36, 6. You save people and animals alike, O Lord. Or Revelation 5. And I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. A blessing God. Liberals like those verses. And they deal with the verses that they don't like by saying things like, Well, you know, the Bible is an ancient patriarchal, culturally conditioned book. And therefore, we cannot take it too Literally. For liberals, God tends to be a lofty concept, like goodness, or truth, or mercy, or love. So for liberals, God is really, really large, which is pretty cool. Because that means that wherever you go, there he is also. For liberals, God is like everywhere and everything, 
which ironically can be a lot like saying he's nowhere and nothing. You see, how would we know who God is if we had no idea who God is not? In other words, how could we know what the good is if we had no knowledge of evil? If God is everywhere and everything, he seems like nowhere and nothing to us. But scripture is clear that God is I am, and so not God must be I am not. And scripture is clear that God is everywhere that's anywhere, and if anything truly is, then God has done it, sustains it, and fills it with himself. I am. So you see, liberals aren't just idiots like you thought. And they got a lot of scripture to back them up. Conservative churches, on the other hand, in my experience, all right, are not so much into to peace, but they're really into righteousness. They love the idea that God is all about righteousness. And so there is a right and there's a wrong. There's an inside and there's an outside. So when I joined up, we didn't do many trust exercises. But we talked an awful lot about us and them, culture wars, and whether or not Pokemon cards were good or evil that became important. Conservatives quote verses like Revelation 22, 15. Listen closely. Outside the city, and that would be the new Jerusalem, by the way. Outside the city in the valley of Gehenna, outside the city in the valley of Gehenna, outside the city are the dogs and the sorcerers and the pornoi, the sexually immoral. Everyone who likes and does the false. Conservatives will quote verses like that and then deal with the verses that they don't like, the ones the liberals do like, by saying things like this. Well, you can't take that all things new verse literally. That's poetry. Common sense tells you that's impossible. Conservative churches, in my experience, don't consider God to be actually everywhere and everything, but very much somewhere and something. Like... Uh, this where and this, this thing. Like the law and the covenant in a box in the Holy of Holies. Like Jesus, a dude in, in the Middle East between 0 and 33 AD, period. Uh, like the one we define in books and we print on our t-shirts. You know, the one that we know. John 14, 6, Jesus said this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's one way. One truth, one life, one very narrow door. So you see, conservatives really aren't the idiots that you thought they were. And they've got a lot of really good Bible verses to back them up. Now, this is a gross oversimplification, but it seems to me that for liberals, God is very, very big, but they don't know who or what he, she, it, or they is. <laughs> but conservatives are pretty sure that they know exactly who he is, but they keep him in a pretty little box, which raises a question. What about the people that don't have access to that box? Like, you know, indigenous tribal peoples in the jungles of the Amazon. Or maybe people that, was, that were born before Christmas, before Jesus was born into this world. Or the Canaanites, Amorites, Jebusites, people of the land that Israel was to, quote, devote to destruction upon entering the, the land. Or just old dogs like Adam, Noah, and Abraham, none of whom had ever been to a confirmation class. Not one of them would have said the sinner's prayer. They wouldn't have known what they were talking about. Exactly. Well, anyway, is God big enough to save them? Or must he remain in the box? Well, it seems to me that if you're completely inclusive, like some liberals, then you are simultaneously exclusive of salvation. For there's nothing left from which anyone needs to be saved. 
But if you're completely exclusive, like some conservatives, well, you are going to end up excluding everyone but yourself, in which case you're all alone, trapped in hell, which is this very little box. It seems to me that for liberals, God tends to be extremely big, but profoundly vague. And so they make him whomever they want him to be and say some really silly things and fall apart when confronted by evil. And it seems to me that for conservative, God tends to be wonderfully specific and incredibly small. So, so when you do actually need to get saved, you're already convinced yourself that God can't save you and you in fact kind of need to save yourself from him. Seems to me that liberals are tempted to pantheism. The idea, you know, that God is simply everything and everywhere. And conservatives are tempted to paganism, where God is simply the God of your particular tribe, your ever-shrinking tribe that ends with you alone in hell. It seems to me that what we need is a God so big that whenever and wherever we go, God is. I am is. And there's nowhere that he is not. And yet we need a God so small that we could know him and therefore trust his heart. And you see, it seems to me that that's exactly the God we've got. And yet the God we struggle so hard to believe for we think it's impossible for him to be both things at once. We, we just ended, that's what that sound means. We just ended our study of Romans. Uh, you remember we did it by preaching on the mystery of time and eternity. And uh, the, the mystery of good and evil. And the mystery of Christ. And now, uh, before we begin another series, probably sometime in the fall, I'd like to just preach some Bible stories and point to the wonderful mystery that is our God. Big enough to show up anywhere and small enough that we could trust his heart when he does. One of my favorite stories comes from the very dawn of human history, about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. In Genesis chapter 14, Keter Laomer, that's the guy's name, Keter Laomer, the king of Elam, and four other kings of the east, they make war on the five kings of the valley of Siddim. That's the location of the Dead Sea. It is the lowest point. You can't get lower than this. It's the lowest point on the surface of the earth. They make war and defeat the five kings of Siddim, including the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 14, verse 10. Now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits, that's tar pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled from those four kings, some fell into them and the rest fled into the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother. Remember, Abram's going to become Abraham. Abram, who was dwelling, uh, Lot, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and they went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, Mamre the, the, Am, the Amrite, brother of Eschol and Aner. These were allies, allies of Abram. These allies of Abram came to Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan, that's northern Israel now, and he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen, his nephew Lot, with his possessions and the women and the people. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah, that is. So yeah, Abram, who becomes Abraham, saved Sodom and Gomorrah. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Next verse. After his return from the defeat of Keter Loamar, or Loamar, 
and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet Abram at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Now, from the evidence of Scripture and also the writings of the ancient historian Josephus, it seems pretty clear that this is the valley of Shaveh. I took this picture. Um, actually, Jolene was, was with me, I think may, maybe a few others, but I took this picture years ago. Uh, the valley on the left, you can see kind of a little valley on the left, is the Kidron Valley. At Passover, it would just run red with the blood of lambs slaughtered in, in the temple. The valley on the right, below the enclosed field, you can see kind of an enclosure there on the right, that's the potter's field, and that valley is the Hinnom Valley. In Hebrew, and then in Greek, Gehenna, which in most English Bibles is translated hell. The flat spot where these two valleys meet was most likely called the Valley of the Plain, the Valley of Shaveh. So get the picture. Abram has just returned from, quote, the slaughter of the kings. In, in the Old Testament, God commands war at times, but he hates violence. And so, for instance, he tells David that he cannot build him a house because he has shed so much blood. He has so much blood on his hands, and Abram just shed an immense amount of blood. And Abram is confusing, is a confusing and confused character at this point. In the last chapter of Genesis, Abram literally pimps his wife Sarah to the Pharaoh of Egypt just to save his tail. And in the chapter before that, God calls him when he's just this random, random pagan, calls him for no apparent reason. So Abram just shed a great deal of blood to save his troubled nephew Lot and Sodom, which we've already learned in Genesis was a very wicked place because this is what Ezekiel says, they were proud and they didn't care for the poor and they treated sex as if it was a commodity, a, a transactional relationship. Pornoy. Not a sacred communion. What we call sodomy isn't really even mentioned per se, but rape is. Whatever the case, there's my point, slaughtering people must be thoroughly traumatic. But slaughtering hundreds or thousands of people in order to save some very, very wicked people, well, that's all just got to be kind of confusing. So Abram is returning from the slaughter of the kings with blood on his hands 2,000 years before the birth of Christ and he meets the king of Sodom at the edge of hell. You ever been there? Have you? In some form, I bet so. Just think of that place. Is God big enough for that place? To handle that place? And is he small enough so that when he did, you could know him and believe? I took this picture from the location of the southern wall of the ancient city of Salem. In Sumerian, Uru Salem, where we get the word Jerusalem, foundation of peace or city of peace. Next verse, verse 17. The king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the edge of hell, verse 18. And Melchizedek, the name means king of righteousness. He sounds kind of conservative. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, that is king of peace, now he sounds kind of liberal. He brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, El Elyon. This is the first time that the word priest appears in all of Scripture. And God Most High, El Elyon, only appears here in Genesis 14, just like this. It's a Canaanite name. It's a Canaanite name for the highest god in the Canaanite pantheon. The name is found on ancient clay tablets from 1500 BC. This Melchizedek fellow is not a Jew. 
He's a Canaanite. Most likely a, a, a Jebusite, an ancestor to the people of the land that Moses and the Israelites were commanded to ritually slaughter 400 years later upon entry into the promised land. Slaughter as a devoted offering to the Lord. So, is God big enough to handle a place like that? And is he small enough that you could know his heart and trust his heart when he does? Verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Bread and wine is a phrase that only appears three times in all of the Old Testament. So this isn't normal. And it appears to have some sort of special meaning, bread and wine. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a high priest of God Most High, El Elyon, and he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He tithed to him. C.S. Lewis wrote, If you are a Christian, you are free to think that all these religions, even the queerest ones, contain at least some hint of the truth. When I was an atheist, I had to try to persuade myself that most of the human race have always been wrong about the question that mattered to them most. When I became a Christian, I was able to take a more liberal view But of course, being a Christian does mean thinking that where Christianity differs from other religions, Christianity is right and they are wrong. As in arithmetic, there is only one right answer to a sum, and all other answers are wrong, but some of the wrong answers are much nearer being right than others. Well, as we'll see this week and next week, uh, the king of Sodom was pretty far off. At that time, the king of each city or tribe would be the representation of a tribal deity. In fact, they were often seen as manifestations of that deity. And so what if you grew up in Sodom and you were forced to worship their god, the god of Sodom? In the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, there's this wonderful scene where the children meet this bewildered soldier from the enemy's army. They meet him after they have entered the new Narnia. That's the age to come, the picture of, of heaven. And they ask this soldier how he got there. And about this crazy encounter that he had with Aslan the lion. Because you see, this enemy soldier had been a servant of the demon god, Tash. The soldier describes how terrified he was to meet Aslan the lion, and then he says this to the children. The glorious one bent down his golden head and touched my forehead with his tongue and said, Son, thou art welcome. But I said, Alas, Lord, I am no son of thine, but the servant of Tash. He answered, Child, all the services thou hast done to Tash, I account as services done to me. Then by reason of my great desire for wisdom and understanding, I overcame my fear and I questioned the glorious one and said, Lord, is it then true, as the ape said, that thou and Tash are one? The lion growled so that the earth shook, but his wrath was not against me. And he said, It is false. Not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites. I take to me the services which thou hast done to him, for I and he are of such different kinds that no service which is vile can be done to me, and none which is not vile can be done to him. Therefore, if any man swear by Tash and keep his oath for the oath's sake, it is by me that he is truly sworn." though he know it not, and it is I who reward him. And if any man do a cruelty in my name, then though he says the name Aslan, it is Tash whom he serves, and by Tash his deed is accepted. Dost thou understand, child? And I said, Lord, thou knowest how much I understand. But I said also, for the truth constrained me. Yet I have been seeking Tash all my days, 
Beloved, said the glorious one, unless thy desire had been for me, thou wouldst not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. Isn't that beautiful? And yet, unlike the king of Sodom, Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem, didn't serve a Canaanite demon like Tash. And he wasn't partly right. (laughs) Apparently, he was like spot on. Now, this utterly confused the ancient rabbis. In the Psalms, David, who now took Like a thousand years later, he took Jerusalem from the Jebusites by by force. In the Psalms, David prophesies that the Messiah will be, quote, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In Hebrews, Paul, or someone who sounds very much like Paul, he writes this. Listen closely. Verse 19 of chapter 6. We have a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, right? That's the inner chamber, the sanctuary, the age to come. Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever or into the age after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest into prosperity for, forever." See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, right? That's through the priests of Israel under Moses. If, 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 if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, What further need would there have been for another priest, talking about Jesus, to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, talking about Jesus, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest, literally, into the age. That means that Jesus, like Melchizedek, comes from the age to come, which was in the Holy of Holies in the heart of Jerusalem. He, he comes from the age to come to bring us home to the age to come, which is eternity. So, Hebrews 7, chapter 17, it is witnessed of him, Jesus, you are a priest into the age after the order of Melchizedek. Isn't that crazy? Now, some argue that Jesus, that Melchizedek actually was Jesus. Others argue that he must have been different than Jesus because scripture refers to him as another priest. Whatever the case, we know that he is at least the image of Jesus. 2,000 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem just south of Uru Salem. Jesus descended from the Jerusalem above and the age to come. He is king of righteousness and king of peace. On Good Friday, the sixth day, he came out of the city and was crucified on a tree in a garden for the sin of Adam. That's all of us. Psalm 85, righteousness and peace have kissed. They kissed when Jesus, the king of righteousness and king of peace, offered us what? His body broken and his blood shed at the boundary of time and eternity, hell and heaven, this age and the age to come. He offers us bread and wine just outside the gates of Uru Salem. The curtain in the box in the temple rips and eternity invades time. If Melchizedek wasn't Jesus, he certainly was the image of Jesus. And the thing that Melchizedek offered 
bread and wine must have somehow actually been Jesus. Even though Melchizedek is clearly the work of Jesus who upholds the universe by his word of power, according to Hebrews chapter 1. So, um, if Melchizedek was of the order of Melchizedek, right? Which we're pretty sure Melchizedek was of the order of Melchizedek. Which is the order of Jesus. 2,000 years before Jesus was born. Why would it bother us to suppose that others might also have been of the order of Melchizedek before Jesus was born? You know, they postulate that there was actually a guy named Krishna that lived one to 3,000 years before Jesus was born. And clearly, from what I understand, the legends do not all agree. And things may have been dramatically altered over time, but maybe he was of the order of Melchizedek. Buddha lived five to 600 years before Jesus. I remember reading his stuff in college and thinking, dang, this guy sounds just like Jesus in the Gospel of John. Buddhism has led a lot of folks, like my friend Brett, to Jesus. Why couldn't Buddha be of the order of Melchizedek? And now I know why this makes us nervous, right? We think if God is that big, how would we know who he is and who he isn't, and so guard from deception? In other words, not every spiritual leader is good, and some are downright evil. How do I know the good from the evil? In other words, how do I tell Melchizedek, the king of righteousness and peace, from Bera, who according to one lexicon means son of evil. How do I tell Melchizedek, king of peace, from Bera, king of Sodom? Both of them were Canaanite kings and neither of them was wearing a Jesus t-shirt. For now, just hang on to that question. So anyway, Genesis 14, Abram receives the blessing, the bread and wine, freely offered as grace. And then Abram freely offers his worship to God through Melchizedek by giving one-tenth of all that he had to Melchizedek. Chapter 14, verse 20. And Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. 21. And the king of Sodom, the king of Sodom now, who's there, remember, said to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. These are the things he'd captured when he captured those, those kings. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord. I've sworn to the Lord, God most high. Literally, check this out, El Yahweh, El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. So Abram can tell somehow that the king of Sodom, which means, Sodom means burnt or burning, wants to enter into a transactional relationship with Abram. He wants business deals. He wants to pay and to be paid for communion. He's proud. If he could, he would own the stars and try to capture the moon. But the king of righteousness and peace just freely gives communion. The bread and the wine just walks out of the city and gives it to Abram. He's humble. And that's grace. He knows that God is the creator and possessor of heaven and earth. And, well, that's everything. Abraham, Abram, received that grace, which is the good. And then Abram freely chose the good and rejected the evil. And check it out, this all happens 2,000 years before Jesus said to the Pharisees, who were really into transactional relationships with God, he said to the Pharisees 2,000 years before, Abraham saw my day. He saw my day. Where did Abraham see his day? 
It must have been in the hands of Melchizedek. Abraham saw my day and was glad, said Jesus. Before Abraham was, I am. (laughs) The author of Hebrew goes on to point out that the new covenant is the eternal covenant, the covenant. There's one covenant. Which means that the old covenant of law is contained within the eternal covenant of grace. Like the law was contained within the ark in the temple. Like temporality itself is contained within eternity. So amazing. Anyway, Melchizedek and Jesus come from a a realm in which everything is good and it is finished. And so there are no transactions to be made. And there is no chronological time within which to make them and then, you know, fulfill them. So anyway, back to our question. How do we recognize the order of Melchizedek and the blessing of God and at the same time reject the order of Sodom and the curse of evil? Well, maybe. I think this is it. How do we recognize the difference between the good and the evil? Well, the blessing, the bread and the wine is free. It's grace. But the offers of Sodom will always require a transaction. It's the work of the flesh. It's Mises and not Jesus. You know, Paul warned of the danger of taking the bread and the wine in an unworthy manner. But he was not protecting the bread and the wine from the people. He was protecting the people, read it, from the bread and the wine. And the unworthy manner isn't a list of sins that we could judge in another person. The unworthy manner is thinking that you could earn the grace of God. If you think that you could earn anything, including yourself, the grace of God will burn You know, Melchizedek just offered the bread. He just walked out of the city, offered the bread and the wine to Abram. There's no mention of confirmation classes, the age of accountability, or church membership. Melchizedek just offered grace, and I highly doubt that Bera, king of Sodom, would even touch it. And yet I think it did touch him a short time later. And it burned. We'll talk about that more next week. (laughs) But let it be a lesson. Receive God's grace wherever you find it and whenever it is offered. But the moment that someone asks you to make a vow, form a covenant, pay a fee, or swear allegiance, just walk away. Because it will burn. It's evil. It's nothing. You see, in some wild, crazy way, I think God is actually everywhere and everything, but he's absolutely not nowhere and nothing. He's, he's, not, he's not vague, but he's incre- incredibly specific. And now our words utterly fail. And I'm going to have to remind you of those mysteries we pointed to last time in Romans. But in Scripture, there is this fascinating dualism that really isn't a dualism. Or or not a dualism as we think of, or like any other dualism. It's the dualism between good and evil. The dualism between light and dark, truth and lies, being and non-being. That is between I am and I am not. So the good is not just one more tribal deity that goes out to battle with some other tribal deity. The good is all-powerful, ever-present, absolute grace. To think, to think that you could have a transactional relationship with the creator and the possessor of all things is an absolute illusion called evil. But to trust that the creator of all things freely gives us all things is the knowledge of the good, who is God, and can only be known 
by grace. The good is God who allows us to experience what God is not that we might forever enjoy exactly who it is that God is. So God is larger than any liberal could ever imagine. And God is more specific than any conservative would dare to believe. God is Jesus. And God is not, not Jesus. And that means that rejecting Jesus isn't simply rejecting some tribal deity. It's rejecting reality itself. And accepting Jesus is accepting reality itself. The way, the truth, the life, the light, the logic, the reality, and everything that's anything, which you can know. For reality is not just everything and nothing, it's Jesus. <laughs> the guy who picked up little children and blessed them and turned water into wine at a party and hung on a tree in a garden for the love of you. I'm saying that Jesus is a very, very narrow door. And yet that very, very narrow door descends into the lowest parts of the earth and fills all things with himself. He fills I am not with I am. So all dogs go to heaven. Even the old king of Sodom. But when Bera, the son of evil, is made new, he's no longer evil but good, and a particular type of good. He is the glory of God. He is the image of God. He is the manifestation of grace. So I, I just, I hope you see how amazing this story and actually every story is. God, who is larger than large, chose to be small, that he might descend into us, be known by us, and then fill all things with himself. God, who is larger than large, chose to bless Abram with a word that is a promise the size of a seed and a piece of bread and wine that grows into a kingdom. God, who is larger than large, chose to become a tribal deity in order that his people, the ones he knows, would call everyone into his tribe to feast upon his grace. You see, the new Jerusalem... <laughs> is already coming down in Genesis chapter 14. The bread and the wine are the substance of things hoped for. The substance of the one that will be born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's Jesus in whom all things hold together. So God, who is larger than large, chose to be as small as a baby in a manger and weak as a man on a cross, that he might fill all things with himself and we would know him and forever enjoy him when he does. God is big enough to handle any place in which you find yourself. And God is small enough that you would know him when he does. And you can recognize him because he's absolutely free. He's a priest. Into the age after the order of Melchizedek, he's Jesus. That's my first point. This is my second. Four years ago was like a week before Christmas or something. I was feeling sorry for myself because I had been kicked out of both my, my tribes. I was actually ordained in both of those denominations. In 1981, through my dad, though, I'd been rejected by the mainline liberal Presbyterian church. In 2007, I'd been rejected by the conservative evangelical Presbyterian church. I was feeling sorry for myself. So anyway, Susan and I were going to Red Robins late one night. I mean, I, the kids are all, you know, they're off now. We were going to go get a cheeseburger at Red Robin. And we had just gotten off of 285 on Wadsworth. I remember this spot real clearly. And Susan, she said this to me. She said, hey, Peter, um, who's Melchizedek? Is he one of the wise men in the, in the Bible? And I said, oh, no, honey, I think you're thinking of the legend of Melchior. He, they say he was one of them, but Melchizedek is somebody else. And then she said, huh. So uh, Melchizedek's in the Bible. I said, yeah. And she said, is, is Melchizedek a good guy or is he a bad guy? And I said, oh, well, he's not a bad guy. Melchizedek is this like 
crazy wild character that shows up in the Old Testament, like at the very start of Genesis. She said, oh, so, so Melchizedek is a good guy. And I said, yeah, he, he's a good guy. And she said, well, well good. Because God's been telling me that you are of the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> If that's true of me, I think it's also true of you. True of those that believe God is larger than large, and yet as small and specific as a piece of bread and a drop of wine, and that he is absolutely free. There's something deeply satanic about the fact that we, the institutional church, have fought countless wars over communion. We've kept it locked up in our respective boxes. And we have refused to give it to those that we have judged to be unworthy. Conservative churches and liberal churches. I've found that people committed to liberalism can be profoundly intolerant. And people committed to conservative-ism can be the worst idolaters. And so I hope that you would be more liberal than liberals. And that you would be more conservative than conservatives. I hope that you'd be so liberal that you'd go anywhere. The slums of Calcutta, prison cells in Canyon City your neighbor's backyard for their weird block party that makes you feel uncomfortable. I hope you'd be so liberal that you'd go anywhere and I hope you'd be so conservative that when you get there, you would offer them Jesus. Not a pamphlet, not an ultimatum, not a transaction, but a presence, the presence of grace, the revelation of love. In the book of the Revelation, Jesus is called the faithful witness. And in the Old Testament, the faithful witness is the moon. It reflects the light of the sun, right? I mean, it's just huge. It's always there. But we often don't look and we often can't see. And yet, people can see you. And they can see Jesus in you, the little old you, if you let them. So what is it to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek? I think it probably looks something like this. Not that. This. One night I was bored in my apartment and decided to take my telescope out to the sidewalk. The moon was out and I thought, why not? Within a few minutes, people started walking over and asking what this thing was. Well, what is that, bro? It's a telescope. Whoa. Do you want to check out the moon? Do you want to take a look at the moon? What is it? It's the moon. Supposed to You're supposed to look right here. Oh, in the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's where it all started, and it just sort of went from there. I'm looking at the moon. Hold on, okay. Hold on. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I can't believe it. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god. No way. No way. No way, that's the moon? No way. Yeah, way. <laughs> no. Oh, you can see the craters. Yeah. yeah. That is so cool. Oh, my God. Get closer, get closer, get closer. Get closer. Get closer. Get get wider. Whoa. What? 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 Look at the edge. I want to see more of it. I've never seen this before. I've never seen this before like this, man. Wow, that is intense right there, boy. Woo, bro, that looked like that's right down the street, man. <laughs> yes, 
Man, what you got here? Man, that looks like that's right down the street. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's right. Is that an actual image of the moon? Is it like a live image? It's that right there. be able to see it up close and feel like you could almost reach out and touch it. And that's what makes it real to us. That is incredible. I kind of felt like I just landed on the moon. <laughs> it makes you realize that we are all on a small little planet and we all have the same reaction to the universe we live in. Wow. Whoa. I think there's something special about that, something unifying. It's a great reminder that we should look up more often. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night before the moon rose blood red over Jerusalem, the faithful witness, and, and now you know I'm not talking about the physical moon, right? The faithful witness took bread and he broke it saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of, of me. You see, you're like an old dog that starts howling at the moon until all the dogs in the neighborhood Join the chorus. God, that's huge, is love. And God loves you. That's kind of small. And he wants you to know just who he is and what that means. Amen. So close your eyes. And I want you to speak to the Lord God. And you can say these words after me silently in your heart. Lord God, you are the possessor of heaven and earth. And that includes me. I confess that I thought I was the possessor of myself. <laughs> so I turn me in gladly and freely. Because in Jesus, I see that you are good. And the good is what you want for me. Now, if you just prayed that, the Bible has a word for that, and it's called repent. <laughs> it means just change your thinking. You just chose the good and rejected the evil. So stay in that place. Lord God, I thank you that you are good. Thank you that you will um, show us the way because you are the way. You're the truth. You're the life. And so we worship you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.